right, so we are getting started. Welcome to everybody who's tuning in to another EBFA educational webinar. I always appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule, especially for those who are tuning in live. I know that some of you are from many different countries. I recognize some of the names from Australia. Uh, good morning and welcome to everyone. So uh, we're going to take a probably 30 minutes or so to go over a very interesting topic. This topic will be supplemented with the research articles that are referenced throughout this. Two of them, as I'd mentioned, are already in the handouts section of the control panel. So if you are wanting to download those, you can do those while the presentation is going on. Please note that after this ends, you will not be able to reference this control panel and the actual downloading of those handouts. So I will be e emailing everyone a archived version of this webinar, as well as a uh, Dropbox folder that has the PDF to the presentation or that matches the presentation as well as those two handouts and those research articles. So if you happen to not get those downloaded, don't worry. Okay. As always, as I mentioned, all of them are recorded. You can find any of our past webinars on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. We have some of our webinars that are not on the YouTube channel. So any of the ones on the YouTube channel are our free complimentary education that are intended to, um, expand your concept and approach, um, particularly as it relates to barefoot science and uh, EBFA's concept and approach to human movement. But we also do have some that are recorded. The ones that are recorded, you will find those on the website, the EBFA website, and it's linked under our online education. If you cannot find those and you have questions on where to find those, then just shoot me an email and I would be more than happy to send you a direct link. After I go over the content, we are going to have uh, some time for questions. Depending on how long I speak for, we'll probably have 10, 15 minutes for questions. But I want to make sure that if anyone has anything related directly to what I have said, that I get that addressed. If for some reason you lose the connection, or I do not get to your question, you can always email me at education at ebfafitness.com. Please do follow us as well on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all of those good things. All right, so we are jumping into it. Um, why I'm doing a webinar, why I had wanted to do a webinar on the sciences of the somatosensory system is because I've actually had several requests. So when I'm doing speaking a lot on barefoot science, we, we kind of hear this interchange between proprioception, um, mechanoception, nociceptors, stretch reflexes, texture, and then you throw in interoceptors. So there's a lot of terms that are related to the nervous system as it relates to movement and us as movement specialists. So I wanted to go through and start to introduce and lay out some of these concepts and um, begin to maybe clarify or answer some of the questions you had as far as should you actually be saying mechanoceptor, should you be saying proprioceptors, et cetera. Um, and then I will add in in the end as far as with Naboso, um, part of what people, lay people, consumers, they know proprioception much more. So when you start breaking down nociceptors and thermoceptors, um, they're not going to understand that. So there is a way of you, the practitioner, have any deeper understanding than your clients and patients. And then there's a way that things are often relayed to the public or to the lay person that sometimes as a clinician or practitioner seems like it's almost over watered down. There's an advantage to sometimes having things watered down for a lay person, right? As long as, you know, B2B, professional to professional, we understand where we're going from a, a detailed in-depth perspective. So if anyone is tuning in and has not been on any EBFA webinar before uh, or is not familiar with who I am, my name is Dr. Emily, Dr. Splickle. I'm a podiatrist practicing out of New York City, and I take great pride in being much more of a functional podiatrist, which means that I'm looking at the entire body. I'm looking at the entire human being as an integrated um, 
being integrated structure. This means that I'm looking at them integrated from a biomechanical, mechanical, fascial, and uh, neuromuscular perspective. But I'm also factoring in a lot on autonomic nervous system, breathing, diet, uh, stress levels, um, mind-body connections, things like that. So it's very holistic and integrative. Um, EBFA, founder of that, and then the certifications, Naboso, which I'll speak about towards the end, and then different consulting that I do. Okay, so why is it important as all of us practitioners who are tuned in to understand the somatosensory system? Well, first thing key is that life is sensory, right? When you look at the way that sensory nerves versus motor nerves are broken down, we actually have 10 times as many sensory nerves as motor nerves. That's going to start to tell you from a priority perspective, which is more important. You must have that sensory information coming in. Oftentimes, sensory information or the sensory nerves are going to be referenced as afferent nerves. So the afferent system, which is seeking out the information. It is a very complex sensory system that is bringing in many different stimulation to create a very simplistic picture or representation to the brain. And then that's what's resulting in what we understand is objects and how we manipulate those objects with movement. So really that sensory input shapes our motor system. If we go back to when we were first learning to coordinate movement, so when we are just born and we're learning to crawl and, and coordinate reciprocal limb movement and, and things like that and upright stance, all of that is fed through the sensory information, through the sensory gateway. So when you are just born to the, to the age of four is your peak window of neuroplasticity. So that's when you could think of your sensory system and your afferent system as being super, super wide open, but also really important. So making sure that you are getting optimal sensory stimulation of all the types that I'm going to be referencing which means that it's gonna be things with a vision, olfactory, vestibular, proprioceptive. So you gotta be doing something to the joints. That's why when a child has a, a sensory processing disorder, you can do joint compressions or you, you put like a weighted blanket on them. Those are things to stimulate the joints and the proprioceptors. And then you also have tactile or these touch receptors. All of that is important and all of that needs to be fed to create optimal motor systems or motor programming. Your feet, hands, and face, or really it's the lips and the tongue, are the most sensitive from a sensory perspective. So those, again, if we go back to the sensory inputs that shape our motor system, we really wanna make sure that we're stimulating the feet, the hands, the face, that's why you're putting, or babies are putting things constantly in their mouth, is they're trying to really navigate their world through their senses, because this is when they're first being introduced to all these different senses. They start to feel different textures through the mouth. They get to feel um, different uh, subtleties, even with temperature, are going to start stimulating those nerves as well. Now, if you have any deficit or delay in the sensory input, this could be at any age, but we might want to stay with the children in kind of that, that aspect, can cause a dysfunction, movement dysfunction, a delay in movement dysfunction, or a loss of coordination with the uh, movement program or that motor skill. So sensory always precedes motor. Sensory is 10 times as, as diverse as motor. And if you do not have sufficient sensory, you're not going to have optimal motor. So I, even for Naboso, our, our new hashtag for Naboso is that life is sensory, which is true. And trying to bring that in with all of your clients, with your patients, with yourself, with your families, if you have children, all super, super important. So how does our brain produce movement? This is uh, something that really 
makes us as homeo sapiens with a higher level of cognitive processing very unique. We are able to do complex motor skills. When you're thinking of the complex coordination of playing a musical instrument and the dexterity of the hand, that is something that is very characteristic of us homo sapiens as having this neocortex. If we did not have the neocortex and the advances from a cortical perspective, we would not have the complexity of the motor programming and the skills that we have athletically or artistically, surgically, all of that is critical and really what differentiates us from primates and from any other um, uh, living creature. So when we look at the neocortex and the cortical areas that are involved in movement is that it's going to start from a prefrontal cortex perspective. The prefrontal cortex is really where we do our decision making, our planning. This is where we're starting to create the how for movement. And your prefrontal cortex is linked to vision. I don't go into vision a lot in this, but obviously we know that vision is extremely important. And your eyes really are the first um, outlet of your brain. So vision and optimizing vision really is important to optimal movement. That could be as, as going in detailed as far as blue lights versus red lights. Um, there is, um, it's called Erlen, I-R-L-E-N, Erlen, uh, well, they call it Erlen syndrome, and then there's Erlen-based glasses, and essentially it goes and it tests how, what different light wavelengths due to your brain, right? Where if you are more sensitive, your brain is more sensitive to certain wavelengths, that's going to just start to shut down your entire body, your entire motor system. You're going to get fatigued. You're not going to be able to process things. And all of that is clearly going to be integrated. Your reaction times go down, etc. So I encourage you to look at um, Erlen, I-R-L-E-N syndrome, um, Erlen tests, they have Erlen glasses, etc. Now, outside of the prefrontal cortex, which is really our how system, is we're going into our premotor cortex, which is which is where we are organizing movement. That premotor cortex is then going to be connected to the motor cortex, which is where we are actually executing movement. So if we look at this a little bit differently, where we can see this is that you have some sort of sensory stimulation that is coming in. You have the afferent stimulus. You have the mechanoceptor stimulus that is coming in. That stimulus is then going to go into your brain stem. So it's going to go up your spinal cord, right? So that's the next level of complexity. And then from the spinal cord, it's going to go into your brain stem. And the brain stem is the part of the brain that controls when you have spinal reflexes. So the brain stem in itself can control motor programming, okay, on a reflex based uh, aspect of that. And then your brain stem would then go to your motor cortex. And the motor cortex here is, if you can see kind of the breakdown of this body, this is showing how your brain is creating a association to different parts of the body based off of sensory information. So it is what's called the cortical somatotropic representation of touch. And then if you put all of that, that representation together, that's where you will get what's called the homunculus, which I have pictures of that down a few slides. And that's kind of the funny looking man. If you saw the any of the pictures that I was posting around um, this webinar, and it's showing that the most sensitive areas of the body that are really the gateway for sensory information to how your body represents um, or creates movement are going to be represented through this homunculus. So it's going to be, oh, there we go, it's going to be your hands, your mouth, and then your feet, which is what I had mentioned earlier. So those really are the gateway into your nervous system. Your body is seeking those um, areas of the body for sensory information that it then uses to create a complex coordinated motor programming. Um, the advancement with the hands, which you can see are the, the biggest, is because we use our hands to 
um, kind of navigate and manipulate things. That's why we're constantly touching things and we pick up things. And the foot is is similar, but the foot doesn't have the same com complex dexterous demands as the hand. So they're similar but different. And I'm I'm going to go into those similarities and going to go into those differences. And then same thing with um, oral, so the tongue and the lips is really important. And that's important from a vagal tone perspective as well. So when it comes to your somatosensory system and the afferent input system is is based around two different types of skin, okay? So we have what's called glabrous skin, and the glabrous skin is the skin on the palm of the hands and the skin on the bottom of the feet. And these two areas, the hands and the feet, are the ones that we're going to be focusing on. So the hands and the feet, they're similar, but they're different. So similar, but different. Okay, so when we look at them from a similar perspective is that both of them, glabrous skin in general, has 13 different kinds of afferent fibers. We're not going to go into all 13 of them, but just know that there are many different kinds of afferent sensory fibers that are in the hands and the feet. Now, when it comes to the actual number, the hand has so many more mechanoceptors than the feet. And the sensitivity is going to be different. Your hands are actually more sensitive from a mechanoceptor touch perspective than your feet. And it makes sense, right? Because we need to be constantly manipulating objects. And that's really where the development of the nerves in the hands come from, is needing to be uh, manipulating objects while they are in the hand. Now, if we look at the foot and being very focused on, on barefoot science and foot to core and from the ground up and all of that, understanding the foot and the differences is really important. So research has shown that if we look at the foot, you have 104 mechanoceptors in the foot. I apologize, cross that out, that should say foot. So you have 104 mechanoceptors in the foot compared to that's a big difference, right? So that's huge. But that's really showing that we don't need thousands and thousands. I think I read somewhere that someone said that we have a million. That's not how it is, right? So you have so many nerves. Now, mechanoceptors is different than some of the free nerves that we might have. So it doesn't mean that you only have 104 nerves in the feet, right? We're just being very specific on this type. Now, the sensitivity of the nerves in the feet is actually lower than the hands, which means you need a little bit more stimulus to create a response in the feet compared to the hands, okay? 70% of the receptors on the feet are rapid adapting. We're gonna be looking at that a little bit closer. Now the rapid adapting nerves are the ones that are sensitive to vibration. So I mention this always, always when I'm in my uh, workshops, we understand that vibration is impact forces. So whether it is high frequency or low frequency, we've got you covered because 70% of the nerves in the feet are sensitive to vibration. Okay, now the receptor field in the foot is actually greater. And what that means and how that translates is that the finite sensitivity of the nerves in the hand is much greater. The foot can be a little bit broader and less acute and finite than the hand because of, again, really the purpose of the foot is for you know, standing on the ground, manipulating the ground, okay? And then when we look at the distribution of the nerves, the lateral border, border of the foot has a higher sensitivity, and you'll see that it actually has a little bit more of a distribution, same thing with the ball of the foot, and you see a decreased distribution in the medial arch, which makes sense because in a normal foot, a neutral foot, your medial arch meaning the area directly under, if you can see here, should not be touching the ground. So it doesn't make sense. You don't need that to have um, uh, mechanoceptors to that area. What's interesting is that I've read in uh, some of the arguments of why um, orthotics are good is because they increase the stimulation. So if you bring 
if you have a neutral arch and you wear an orthotic that comes up into your medial arch, right? So now you have skin to orthotic contact that they will argue that you get increased sensory stimulation. But what I would actually argue of why you really don't need orthotics is that you don't even have mechanoceptors on your medial arch. So um, I hope that's making sense and that you can actually use that as an argument of, yeah, they, they really don't increase that, that mechanoceptor stimulation, okay? Now, when it comes to hairy skin, which is gonna be every other part of your uh, body, particularly just above the ankle, around the wrist, forearm, et cetera, thinking around the knee, that's gonna be hairy skin around the knee, right? Is that you have three different types of mechanoceptors. So 13 in the hands and the feet, and then three in the hairy skin. Okay, go ahead. All right, so sorry, going in the wrong direction. All right, so when it comes to sensory nerves, we have four main types. You have nociceptors, which are sharp versus dull. You have thermoceptors, which are hot versus cold. And then you have mechanoceptors, which are shape, texture, vibration. That's going to be primarily what we're focusing on. And then you have proprioceptors, which this is going to be your stretch reflex. Now, when it comes to the proprioceptors, you have four types of proprioceptors. So this is gonna be a little bit detailed, but you have four main types of sensory nerves. Of those, the proprioceptors, you have four types of proprioceptors. You have your GTOs, two different types of of muscle spindles, and then you have your joint capsule proprioceptors. Your mechanoceptors, which are the ones that we're focusing on, these are your haptic receptors, are going to be four types of that as well. We're gonna go into those in a moment, which are going to be fast adapting and slow adapting, okay? Now, when we look at your sensory nerves just in general, your mechanoceptors and proprioceptors actually have a different pathway up your spinal cord than your nociceptors and your thermoceptors. They have a different pathway up your spinal cord as well. So they're related, but they're kind of different in the way that they transfer up into the brain, okay? So when we look at the mechanoceptors and the touch receptors, as I had mentioned, you have slow adapting, and you have fast adapting. Your slow adapting are going to be called SA1, SA2. Your fast adapting are going to be FA1 and FA2, okay? Your SA1, which is a slow adapting superficial nerve, is focused on what's called two-point discrimination, which is of a stimulus one millimeters apart. And why I kind of emphasize that is for anyone who is familiar with, who has or who has tried the Naboso technology mat or insoles, our pyramid is really based around two point discrimination. That's why it's a pyramid and it's a point. And each of those pyramids is one millimeter apart. My goal through the Nobosa mat and that texture is to stimulate the Merkel disc, superficial, okay? So if we go to SA2, which is the Ruffini ending, what's important to note with this is that your Ruffini ending, SA2, is not found in primates. That's very characteristic of homo sapiens is to have the SA2, which is characteristic of skin stretch. Remember that one because I'm gonna talk about it when it comes to fascia, okay? Now your slow adapting mechanoceptors stay stimulated throughout the entire stimulus. So they're constantly reading while that stimulus is going on versus the fast adapting that I'm gonna go into now are, they, they get stimulated right on that onset and then you don't hear from them again. So it's, it's telling you that something has happened but not telling you if it's still happening, okay? So your FA1 is going to be superficial again. This is going to be a low frequency vibration flutter. Okay, that's the Meisner corpuscle. It is superficial, just like the Merkel disc is superficial. Your 
FA2, which is the big one that we speak about all the time in EBFA, is your Pacinian corpuscle, which is a high frequency vibration, and it is deep. Okay, that's going to be important to note as well. So your two receptors, right, so the type 2 receptors are both deep. The type 1 receptors are both superficial. So now let's take this information and let's actually look at the hand. Okay, this is the distribution of the mechanoceptors on the hand. So you can actually see when you look at it, the part of the hand that's probably extremely important really looks like from a two-point discrimination, superficial, you're touching, right? Your, your pointer finger is going to be very important on that. You can see that most of them are centered around that. If you are familiar with the different grips, there is a important grip from an evolution perspective that is between your pointer finger and your thumb. So your pointer finger and thumb is one of the first grips that we were able to uh, learn to do from an evolution perspective, which makes sense of why there's so much happening between the pointer finger and the thumb. Okay. Now the ones that are deep are going to be our two. So you can see them here, the Ruffinis and the Pacinians, right? So skin stretch and high frequency vibration, those are going to be deeper, okay? The uh, flutter vibration, Meissner's FA1, those are also superficial, okay? So just see this, remember this, I will be sending this to you as well. Now, when it comes to the foot, okay, we can look at this is the foot on the left, all of the receptors and their distribution, okay? So you can see that there's very few along the medial arch. So if you're using orthotics to get all the way into the medial arch, to touch that skin, to try to get more mechanoceptor sensory stimulation, there really aren't nerves there anyway. So just kind of think of, of is that really kind of a true effect of that, okay? Now, when it comes to the distribution here, what we can see the FA2, which is going to be the vibration, right? FA1 and FA2, both of those are vibration. You put those together, that's gonna make up the majority of the foot. You can see FA1, which is the low frequency flutter vibration, that actually has most of the distribution in the foot, which is which is really incredible, okay? FA2 is gonna be a little bit faster, different type of vibration. I often reference to people, and it's also deeper. So what I'll tell people is the FA2s really are in the landing pad of the foot. So if you think you're coming down from a jump, your jump is going to have a different frequency than if you're just doing normal walking, right? The frequency is going to change based on what you're doing, okay? So again, thinking of this distribution, thinking of these different nerves, are they superficial, are they deep, and what are they sensitive to, okay? And the difference between the hand and the feet. All of this relating to touch has to do with what's called a mechanoceptor, okay? So these are mechanoceptors. So I understand that when I speak of Naboso, I often say proprioceptors and proprioceptive. Why I say that is because it's a much more uh, layman's term that the general public will understand. To start going into proprioceptors versus mechanoceptors, right? Sometimes it's easier to just stay within what the uh, kind of consumer will understand. And then it gives you the opportunity to go in a little bit more detail about proprioceptors and mechanoceptors, okay? And they're deeply related and they go through the exact same spinal track, okay? Now, this is looking at your skin, a little bit different perspective, so that you can um, so that you can see the way that they're actually distributed. Okay, so this is going to be a cut. Think of this as so glabrous skin again is going to be the bottom of the foot and the palm of the hand, and then the hairy skin, let's say, is going to be the ankle. So this is that relationship, okay, foot ankle. So here. <clears throat> Merkel's disc, or Merkel, Merkel receptor here they call it, is your SA1. So you can actually see how superficial it is, right? So it's superficial and it is sensitive to, do you guys remember? To the two point discrimination that is one millimeter apart. Now as we age, you start to lose that what it's called is your spatial acuity range. So your spatial acuity range is one millimeter 
between each of these Merkel discs. You start to uh, widen or lose that acuity with age, which means now they only send two millimeters between each other or three millimeters, right? So you can start to see that that's going to affect your movement accuracy as you start to change what's called your spatial acuity of your mechanoceptors, okay? Now, if we go to the next superficial one, so the next kind of deep within your skin, you're going to have your Meisner's. These are the FA1. These are the ones that are sensitive to, have you guys quiz yourself. Hopefully you said low frequency vibration, which is the flutter. Okay, this one is going to contract on the onset where the SA2 is going to stay the entire time that you are uh, engaged in that movement, etc. Okay, again, Nabosa technology is going after the SA1s from a texture perspective and then from a hardness and some of the other facets of the, of the mat, we're hitting some of the other uh, mechanoceptors. Now, if we go deeper into the uh, tissue, you can see that you have your Ruffinis, which are your SA2. These are going to start being deep. And then if we go, uh, these one, what is this sensitive to? Hopefully you said skin stretch. So that's your skin stretch, right? And that's going to be also pressure. So think deep pressure is going to get into the Ruffini. And then if you have kind of a shift in movement. So if you think of the nerves from a massage perspective, that's going to be a deeper pressure massage that has slow movements. So slow kind of um, continuous movements with like the heel of the hand. That type of massage is going to be targeting the Ruffini. Uh, endings. Okay, and then if we go next deep, we're going to get into our deepest mechanoceptor, which are, is your Pacinian corpuscle, your FA2. This is sensitive to, you can test yourself. Hopefully you say high frequency vibration. This goes um, as high as 300 hertz, so that's really high. And what we're going to tie this into Next is if we take a little look and we look at the foot here. So this is, pretend that this is glabrous skin. So it doesn't have the hair. That's not an actual uh, representation. There is a cadaver cut and a, a picture of a cadaver cut cross section of the foot that showed this beautiful integration of the plantar fascia through the ligaments into these interstitial fascial fibers here into the skin. And really what it was showing is that the glabrous skin is deeply connected to the plantar fascia. Why I wanna mention that is that in your plantar fascia, in your palmar fascia, in the palm of your hand, which is really tight to the tissue, your skin is kind of hard. If you take the palm of your hand and you try to pull the skin, the glabrous skin on the palm of your hand away from your body, right? So you're trying to pull it as much as you can. It's it's really adhered down there pretty tight, right? That is for a reason from a mechanoceptor perspective. You got the exact same thing on the foot. If you try to pull your glabrous skin away from your foot, it doesn't really pull, right? And then if you go into the top of the hand, it's different, right? It has a different kind of relationship between hairy skin and superficial fascia and glabrous skin and the fascia that lies underneath that. Okay, that's what I want to focus on is the palmar planter. Okay, so when we look at that, you actually have a relationship between your Pacinian corpuscles and your Ruffini endings, which are your deep mechanoceptors that actually goes into your fascia. So when it comes to the mechanoceptors of your fascia, the mechanoceptors of the fascia, what you find in here, this is one of the articles that I, I had tied in, Robert Schleip is speaking about this, is that you have, again, your SA2 and your FA2 in your fascia. Your Ruffini endings, I spelled that wrong, I apologize, is you can find Ruffini endings, which again is the skin stretch element, right? Skin stretch, slow onset, you're gonna get the stimulus the entire time that the, the stimulus is happening. You find them in the dorsum of the hand, so the top of the hand, the outer layer 
of your joint capsule, which we know the joint capsule is related to stretch. So as you move a joint, if you're moving your ankle, you are getting a stretch to the joint capsule and you are stimulating not just proprioceptors, but mechanoceptors, which is different, similar but different, of the Ruffini endings. You will find this in your ligaments. So we know that the way that you stimulate a ligament is by stretching it right and typically typically we thought that you don't get a stimulus from your ligaments until you are at end stretch however that's not true you do now get a faster stimulus from your ligaments at the onset and then continuous through that stretch which means that let's say if you're thinking of an ankle and you're trying to avoid an ankle sprain it's not it's not that you have to be at all the way it's inversion as far as you can before you get a stimulus to your nervous system. Even like micro movements of your ankle and inversion and eversion is stimulating the nervous system through these Ruffini endings. Okay. And then what's really cool, which was referenced in Robert Schleip's work, is showing that Ruffini ending stimulation, think go back to massage if you want, has a suggested lowering of the sympathetic nervous system which is great, right? So that's where you could start to see some of the application of massage and fascial release work in a slow stretch way, what that's going to do to the sympathetic nervous system. For those that are focused on autonomic nervous system and vagal tone, highly encourage you to read that article by Robert Schleip and delve into it a little bit more as far as how they reference uh, the refining endings and different massage and manual therapy techniques, okay? Now, when it comes to the Pacinian corpuscle, remember this is the vibration, and this is going to be on the onset of vibration. Where you find Pacinian corpuscles is going to be the bottom of the foot, so the plantar fascia, the palmar fascia, reference that as well. So your plantar fascia is a very important vibration structure. So I will often see patients getting plantar fasciitis when they are uncontrolling or they're, they're not controlling impact forces or vibrations effectively. They often have a delayed foot because they're not anticipating that stimulation of the Pacinian corpuscles or vibration. Okay. You also have Pacinian corpuscles in your aponeurosis, which if you're not familiar with the aponeurosis, it is the, uh, I feel like I didn't spell that right either. It's okay. Um, it is going to be almost like the uh, retinaculum that is surrounding the joints. So it is a thinner fascial structure. And then this was interesting is that the Pacinian corpuscle is the deeper aspect of the joint capsule where the outer layer, the more superficial aspect of the joint capsule, which is stretch is Ruffini. And then the deeper vibration is going to be Pacinian. Together, they are working to create the movement control of the ankle, which is again, complex. So we need these very diverse input systems. And then you will also see it in the periosteum of the bone. So that's where I will see um, a patient who, again, is not controlling impact forces and vibration. They're insufficiently stiff when they strike the ground. Those are the patients who are getting a calcaneal periostitis. So if you've ever had a patient or a client have um, heel pain and it's retrocalcaneal, which means it's the back, but it's not really on the Achilles tendon. And you know that it's more like kind of this fascial saran wrap that's coming around the, the, the calcaneus. That's going to be the periosteum and the periostitis. I often associate that when they're not controlling the vibration. So um, start to think of that as well in those, in those clients. Something like that, a lot of periostitises, if you're suspecting that, they actually won't show up on an MRI, which means you need to use your clinical skill and um, kind of deductive skill and higher, higher knowledge to then bring that understanding to that patient. Last type of uh, mechanoceptor that I want to go into is type 3 and type 4. So we were just speaking about type 1 and type 2. Now, type 3 and type 4, these are going to be called, or what's called, interstitial mechanoceptors. Now, these are often referred to as free nerve endings. Oftentimes, we will associate free nerve endings with pain. 
that's the way that I had always learned it in school is a free nerve ending equals pain. And that's going to be that kind of um, a nerve that is stimulated when you have some sort of pain stimulus, you touch something hot, etc. So what they're now showing is that free nerve endings are actually making up your thermal sectors as well. That's a free nerve. And then it's also responsive to uh, different chemo, uh, chemical, neuropeptide signals through the body, which is going to get a little bit more complicated. I apologize. But it's going into how you could start to have um, different changes through a pH right, or what's called a neurogenic inflammation can start to stimulate these interstitial mechanoceptors. If you get an increase in substance P, is that stimulating this interstitial mechanoceptor? It really could be, right? So you want to be thinking from a, a chemokine perspective, almost like hormones going through the body, that there are things that are stimulating our mechanoceptors that are more chemical, hormonal, kind of deep internal that aren't as, as gross and kind of easy to understand as, oh, I feel a texture that is rough, therefore X, Y, Z, right? So there's a lot of things that are happening and that's really what they're finding through these free nerve endings and these interstitial mechanoceptors. This is going to start tying into interoception. So any of the webinars that I've done on interoception, if you have not heard any of them and you're interested in learning more about our interoception webinar series, please go to the EBFA website, click under webinars, scroll down, you will see them there. The interoceptors are going to have a link to the autonomic nervous system. So these interstitial mechanoceptors are related to still mechanoceptors, right? They're, they're playing a role in movement. So it still has what's called a somatosensory role, but now it's also having and linking in that interoceptive role makes it more complex but it just shows how deeply integrated the human body is and how you cannot separate the uh, autonomic function heart rate blood pressure um, digestion and how that links to movement of course that goes into breathing which goes into movement which goes into emotional states and it becomes the very complex structure of how I now look at my patients and how I encourage all of you to start looking at your patients and clients and athletes from a very integrated perspective. So how can you start using this information and this introduction to the somatosensory system is think of and remember the homunculus. Remember the feet as the gateway into the nervous system. Use the hand as the gateway into the nervous system. Use texture, use vibration, use skin stretch. Understand the relationship between feet, hands, and the fascial system. So it really makes sense. Really that homunculus now should have like a fascial web tied in it is that the tensegrity web really is nerve tissue. And a lot of those nerves that are found in our fascial system are mechanoceptor based, which means that they are those raffinis and the facinians and the free nerves and the interoceptors that I spoke of, and it makes it just even more integrated. I also often speak about that when you want to target the fascial system is that you, want to think of your feet as fast, anything with the hands is gonna make you fast, and then anything through the fascial system is gonna make it fast. So here I'm just showing different textures. The one on the left are the Noboso insoles. Um, so that's a way that we can access the um, receptors in the feet, getting them out of their shoes. That's a huge reason why barefoot training is so important. If you start to cut off the mechanoceptor of the side, uh, the mechanoceptor side of the foot, and you become only proprioceptive, which is GTO, muscle spindle, and joint capsule, that means that you are going to have a decreased reaction time. So think of opening all of the sensory gateways, not just limiting it to proprioceptors because their shoes are on. Okay, and then same thing with the hands, incorporate the vision and the vestibular as well. So 
in summary, and then I will take any questions that you guys have. And then as a reminder, I will be sending you the PDF, you have the research articles, and then the recording as well. So in summary, I apologize for my dog. In summary, sensory is critical to creating optimal movement patterns. Sensory, life is sensory, 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 sensory. You must be looking at every human movement that your athletes, clients, and patients are doing by asking yourself, do they have a movement dysfunction because they're not getting sufficient sensory information in? Is it coming or is it a lack of sensory information from the hands, from the feet, from the vision, from the vestibular, or from the fascial system? Sensory feeds the motor cortex, which is prioritized through the homunculus. So you can learn more about the homunculus and the cranial nerves. One program that I would encourage you to check out is called Restorative Breathing with Lois Laney. Amazing, amazing program that I encourage you to check out. I will uh, include her information as well. Both mechanoceptors and proprioceptors play an important role in motor control. Remember that they are going through the same spinal tract. And then nociceptors, thermoceptors, those would actually be your free nerve endings, right? We'll put those in the direction of free nerve endings that have their own spinal tract that they go through. And then they're going to affect the brain a little bit differently. Okay, targeted mechanoceptors of the hands and feet enable better motor control. So if you have someone who has perhaps Parkinson's, MS, um, post-stroke, they're a child with a sensory processing um, disorder or anything along the spectrum, is thinking about how can you incorporate stimulation of the hands, the feet, vestibular, vision, olfactory, um, mouth, thinking like humming, chanting, um, anything through the vagus nerve and the esophagus, you want to be stimulating that as well. And then finally, your fascia is sensory tissue that is deeply involved in all human movement and motor control. Oh, that was your holiday gift to you all. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions, again, the focus of this was much more centered around mechanoceptors versus proprioceptors. But again, just remember that the proprioceptors, the GTOs, the muscle spindles, that's again more your stretch reflex. Proprioceptors are found much more on the side of the muscle. Mechanoceptors, when you look at the muscle tendon junction and if they're uh, lying around that, they will be more on the tendinous side and then they will be also in the glabrous skin. Okay, so I'm going to go through if there is, um, so yes, just kind of uh, uh, reconfirming, Kennedy, that is a great point, that yes, your ligaments are always on. Um, when you look at kind of before the pre-fascial research based, is a lot of people would be looking at ligaments as very passive and that, you know, hey, you're not getting any stimulation until you're all the way at the end stretch. And by the time you're at the end stretch, it's probably too late to correct and protect that inversion moment of the ankle, um, et cetera. So that's, that's not the case. The way that you're better able to tap into your ligaments, this is key, is if you increase your baseline fascial, myofascial tension around a joint. And if you look at a joint, um, and I, I had a, a presentation I used to do around this, it's probably a webinar that you can find on YouTube, and I show a cadaver representation of a joint, ankle joint, wrist, um, elbow, all the same thing, knee, and think of it as this connective tissue web, capsule, ligaments, retinaculum, there's tendons that are crossing through, and they're all blended into each other, and um, they blend into each other in a way that you cannot differentiate them, and then they're also blended into your muscles. So this fascial web surrounding the joint blends in beautifully to the muscles that control that joint. So by creating a baseline um, anti-gravity effect or a little lift of your muscles, let's say we'll use our quads as an example. If you use just a little bit of a lift, an anti-gravity lift of your quads, you're putting a baseline tension around that joint, you essentially tighten the joint, which then creates a much more taut stimulus for all of the mechanoceptors and proprioceptors. 
I hope that makes sense. Where a lot of people live there, like passive in their quads, and you can just see that their quads are like not engaging and they're just kind of hanging into gravity. They're going to be slower into that joint because that would be technically like a loose joint. Um, I totally hope that that visual helps. Um, and that's why I try to teach fascial tension, anti-gravity, postures, anti-gravity, how to create a baseline tension from a tensegrity fascial perspective and how that translates to faster joints. Perfect. Um, looking to see also, um, um, let's see, you guys are so welcome. There's the FA2 in the picture you showed. Got all the plantar service of the third toe. Why? All right. So of the one um, where you're showing that, she's asking the FA2 mechanoceptors are all in the third digit. That is really interesting. It's in the ball of the foot and in the third digit. My guess would be having to do with the center of the foot, even though really the cueing center of the foot is the second digit. The third from a weight distribution perspective, um, my guess is that it's the midline from that weight distribution. So as you're jumping and taking off, you're going to be hitting that third digit from a uh, vibration mechanoceptor stimulation perspective. But that was a really good question. Okay, uh, let's see if there's any other Yes, so um, great question as far as repeating on how the Nebosa mat stimulates the Merkel disc. So remember that the Merkel disc, which is SA1, is superficial. We saw the map of the distribution of that, that receptor, so reference back at that, okay? And essentially what it differentiates is two-point discrimination. So two-point discrimination, so you need it to be a little bit of a pointy texture, which is why the Nebosa texture is a pyramid. And then the spatial acuity of the Merkel disc is one millimeter. So each of the pyramids on the Nebosa mat are one millimeter apart. So that's designed based off of the distribution, the sensitivity, and the spatial acuity of the Merkel disc. I hope that helps. Okay, so there's definitely true science and research behind the Nebosa mat. The durometer and the hardness of the mat is very specific to make sure that any vibrations when you're jumping and landing and walking with the insoles are going to transmit through that material. We try to reduce the amount of rubber that we use in the product as well. Of course, we need a little bit because of mats and insoles, but we're trying to deviate away from that because the rubber actually... Um, takes away some of the vibration, think like rubber flooring in the gyms that takes away the vibration. So it's controlling in a kind of uh, positive, moderate way of the vibration that's coming in, um, especially if you're using them in minimal shoes. You do want the insole to take just a little bit of the vibration so that you're not over um, fatiguing your tissue system and your tissue stress. And um, the flexibility of the insole also allows you to still be in minimal shoes that allow complete freedom of movement, which was also really important as well. Okay, um, the 1.5s, that is actually, for those who are curious on what the Nebosa 1.0 is and the Nebosa 1.5, um, Kennedy was asking what the 1.5 means. It's actually the height. It's not the distance between. Every single Naboso product, the pyramids are one millimeter apart from each other. The mat has a 1.5 height, and then the distance stays one. Our Naboso 1.0 is a one millimeter height on that pyramid, and then the uh, distance stays one. And then the 1.5 is 1.5, right? So um, the height is just changing the ability to stimulate more or less. Children insoles that we are releasing in January, we just launched the pre-orders. Those are all built on 1.0, so it's a one millimeter height, one millimeter distance from each stimuli. And then when we push it more with adults who are used to being barefoot in the stimulation, those are 1.5 millimeters. So, okay. Uh, last question, and then I will uh, send you all off to your holiday weekends. Um, doo -doo -doo. how can we make corrections in the motor cortex without correcting the sensory input first? 
So uh, Brian is asking a really good question that is related to Lois's program, and I know he's taken Lois's program. So that's where what I would say, if you're not familiar with Lois Laney, again, please check out Restorative Breathing. And essentially what she does is she goes through the different cranial nerves to see that if any of them are uh, mismapped or you're creating um, kind of a different sequence. One is compensating for the other. You're going to have a um, discoordination in your autonomic nervous system. It can translate into motor programming, etc. When Lois Laney does her neuro resets, which means she's she's going through the cranial nerves and resetting that homunculus, she's using the hands, the feet, and the mouth to fulfill all of your sensory gateways while she's dealing with the cranial nerves. So um, Brian, and for anyone else who's kind of checking this out, is Lois always uses the Nabosa mat. So she'll have them standing on the Nabosa mat. So you're getting that part of the homunculus. She's having them hold something that is textured in the hand, or you can think of like the, the Chinese stress balls that you can kind of rotate in the hand. That's also creating a stimulus to the hand. And then she'll have the toothpick, she'll have them hum, right? So that's really why she's doing what she's doing from the homunculus perspective. Okay. Um, yes, the name here, I'm typing it in. Last thing that I'm doing, Lois Laney, restorative breathing. She is amazing and super excited. Uh, oops, I just deleted it. Um, is we are actually doing a joint workshop. Ryan, you might be really excited to hear about this. Is we are doing a joint workshop June 1st to 3rd in Chicago. It is on the EBFA website. And we have a day and a half of Lois Laney speaking about her cranial nerves and the way that she looks at sensory sequencing for motor programming. And then you have a day and a half with me. And I'm going to be speaking about how I use the feet and the barefoot mechanoceptor fascial system to then kind of be the next step after her work. So I will send that, I'll include that in the email because it's just gonna be something you guys do not wanna miss. Lois's work is great. And then again, combined with what I'm doing from Barefoot Science, I think it's a really amazing marriage. Um, and uh, she really needs to get her program out in, in many of your professional's hands because I know you can really use it and make an impact with your clients and your patients. So with that, I'm going to say good night or have an amazing day for those who are tuning in from um, Australia and I saw some from Asia as well. Thank you guys for your time and your support of EBFA and Noboso. Have an amazing end of 2017 and I hope to see many of you or all of you in 2018. Take care.